I'm Dr. Lisa Chapel. I'm the chair for the Department of Family Nursing. Um, and we also have with us Dr. Katherine Arterberry. I am Dr. Katherine Arterberry. I am the uh, clinical um, program director. I'm glad to see you all here. We have uh, Rainy Boggs. Rainy, would you introduce yourself? She's actually having um, a little technical difficulty. Um, she'll be just a minute. Susan, do you want to introduce yourself? Are you and Katie both here? Yes, my name is Susan Morgan and I'm an admissions officer here with Frontier. <clears throat> and I am trying to make the world a better place one application at a time. <laughs> <laughs> and Katie? Um, I'm Katie Moses. I'm another admission officer with Frontier, um, and I'm just here learning like the rest of us. Okay, and I see Rainy now. Rainy? Yes, sorry about that. Uh, I'm Rainy Boggs, the Director of Enrollment Management and Financial Aid, and I'm here to represent uh, mainly the Financial Aid Office and for students who have and want to utilize their VA educational benefits. Thank you, Rainy. And I see Jamie Wheeler. Hi, everyone. My name is Jamie Wheeler, and I'm the clinical advisor here for the FNP students. So um, I meet with students at Frontier Bound, and we talk about kind of getting oriented, how to navigate the site and search process. And then I'm here to kind of prompt you along the way until uh, you're ready to start clinicals. Uh, so look forward to chatting with you all. Thanks. Great, thank you, Jamie. Anybody else that we should introduce? Please speak up. No? Well, we're very pleased that you're attending our Q&A session and our purpose is to try to give you as much information as we can so that you can make a decision about applying at Frontier Nursing University. And what you've just seen it really represents our way of operating at Frontier. We work as a team, different part, departments, different people come together to work as a team to help the students not only through admissions, but through finding clinical placement, through their clinical hours, through the, the didactic part of the program. So we really do present a team approach to working with students. Again, here is my information along with Dr. Artaberry's. And I'd like to take a minute and just read our mission statement to you. At Frontier, the mission statement truly drives what we do. It is a resource for course development and for course assignments. And we use it as a ruler. Are we fulfilling our mission through our, the different elements of our program? So forgive me for reading it to you, but it says our mission is to provide accessible nurse midwifery and nurse practitioner education to prepare competent entrepreneurial, ethical and compassionate leaders in primary care to serve all individuals with an emphasis on women's, women and families in diverse rural and underserved populations. And that truly is our mission. It is a living organism to us. In the picture, you'll see one of the events that happens on campus. This is a circle up where students come together and share their reflection and their experiences during the day. So what about Frontier? What do we look like? We adopted a culture of caring several years ago that we use as a framework for our communication and interaction. And in the culture of caring, it contains components such as respect and inclusivity. And it really uh, drives a lot of our communication and our relationships. You can use your community as a classroom when you are ready for your clinical hours, you can certainly do your clinical hours in your community. You know your community best. You can study from the comforts of your home. That is true. You do um, work and do the coursework at home and you students are required to travel to our brand new campus in Versailles, Kentucky, two times while they're in the program once at the very beginning for a session called Frontier Band that is really an orientation to the university 
the resources of the university and then your specific program. And then there is a time on campus called clinical bound that happens just before you go out and start your clinical hours. That um, is a time of testing and preparation for those clinical experiences and the structure of frontier. We have all of our didactic courses up front. We have clinical bound and then at the end we have the clinical hours. So all of the book work, the book learning up front clinical BAM, and then your clinical preceptorship hours. Um, here's some of our achievements at Frontier. Um, we have over 80 years of experience in graduate nursing and midwifery education. We are the first nurse practitioner, family nurse practitioner program in the United States. We actually began in 1970 and we celebrated our 50th year in operation last year, 2020. We have students and alumni that represent every state in the United States. So we have students from all, all states. And we right now have about 8,000 graduates from Frontier. This is a picture of um, students and faculty at a um, AAMP conference in Denver one year. And partly um, having students from across the United States, a lot of what we do is based on student support. And you can really see that even today with all of the members from different uh, departments who are here with you this afternoon, late in the afternoon, early evening, uh, just to make sure that you understand how much you are supported. Some of the supports that you have, our regional clinical faculty and trained uh, clinical preceptors. Now, when we talk about regional clinical faculty, they're some of my favorite people because I'm the clinical program director. And we have faculty assigned to all different parts of the United States so that you will be visited by your regional clinical faculty when you're in the clinical portion of your program. And I think that's something that not all uh, FMP, online FMP programs can say. We're really proud about that. Um, you also have academic advisors and clinical advisors, and you see some of them here today. The academic advisors start with, with you when you come in with your didactic program and getting your, your, your plan of study together and your clinical advisors as well to help you establish um, where you wanna do your clinical sites. You have a team working with you to get it done. Um, there are online student mentoring groups. Um, I don't know what we would do without Rainey and her group with financial aid and, and scholarships. All of us communicate with each other, talk back and forth. We have a wonderful online library service that is consistently ranked very high in our, um, in our evaluations with the with the services that they provide. And also a diversity impact program. When you see what the mission of FNU is, it is to serve under civil, under, uh, you, um, underinsured populations. But we also want to make sure that our faculty is diverse, our student population is diverse, and um, we really stand by that. It's, and we have a whole diversity impact program to make sure that we are supporting our students. Let's take a minute and look at what degrees Frontier offers. Um, some of the degrees options are MSCN, and this is an MSN entry. You would need to have had a BSCN, and you are brand new entry into the MSN program. If you have a prior certification, um, like for example, you're a, a WHMP, Women's Health Nurse Practitioner, practitioner and you want to add the FMP. These are called postgraduate certificates or PGCs. And then we have a DMP program, two admission pathways into the DMP program. One is for the person who is admitted to the MSN program. They're directly admitted to the DMP program. So it's like a dual admission when you're admitted, MSN followed by the DMP. We also have a post-master's DMP program that um, will be presented at a later date from that department. So how much time are we looking at? What kind of time are we looking at? 
Frontier functions on the term system similar to a quarter system. Our terms are 11 weeks in length and there's two weeks between each term where students are essentially off from school. Uh, for the MSN entry student, the length of time is two, two years to three years, depending on how they move through the program, a, either three courses a term or two courses a term. So two years to three years. For the PGC student who already has a prior certification, one to one and a half years. And the DMP, this is the time frame past the completion of your MSN is 15 to 18 months. Um, I do want to, to encourage you when you're looking at programs to attend, one thing that you need to look at is the certification pass rate of the program. That's a pretty objective measure of a quality program. And we're proud at Frontier about with our FMP program because we've had 99 to 100% pass rate for the past three years. So we have a very strong program and you would be very well prepared to serve as a family nurse practitioner. Rainy? Yes. <laughs> uh, well, I was just going to, our students with the, uh, who want to attend, they have an RN with an unencumbered license, must have a GPA of 3.0 in their highest nursing degree, uh, being good in, uh, good standing in their prior education. I'm reading the slide pretty much. Um, hold on, there's a chat popped up. And one year of RN experience from the time that you actually begin coursework. You can still apply to the MSN with a portfolio option, and that's actually on our website and uh, the, the instructions and the guide to complete a portfolio was on there for you to follow. So, uh, as Rainey said, um, for the masters, uh, you would have to have a current active RN license for the PGC criteria as well. Um, now. If you have a certification, we need proof of the certification on the degree. So we need to have a master's or higher degree in nursing in an advanced practice area, such as one of the ones listed below, adult nurse practitioner, geriatric nurse practitioner, et cetera. So you have to have already earned that certificate in order to be eligible for the PGC. This is often confused with students who have a master's in nursing education or nursing leadership or nursing informatics that did not allow them to sit for certification. Those do not qualify for the PGC at this time. Um, we would take your highest nursing degree earned GPA, which is the master's. So you have to have at least 3.0. Normally that's not an issue because you have to have a 3.0 for a master's, but we do check that. Um, and we also check that the program that you received your master's has regional and national nursing accreditation at the time you graduated. We have an upcoming application deadline, you all. It's only an eight day. So April 21st is the deadline to apply to begin coursework on October the 4th. Um, that deadline you must have, you must apply, pay your application fee and have all of your documents, which is um, your essay, your resume, your three health professional references, your transcripts, and like I mentioned before, the portfolio for non-BSNs. And I wanna kind of back up and touch on the transcripts. It's very, very important that your transcripts are the final and official transcripts and they must be received by Frontier by the deadline date. So that's very important. So if you're wanting to apply, I would suggest you as soon as this is over, get on get on the horn or online and try to get your transcripts requested as soon as possible. Um, our tuition we charge by the per credit hour rate and currently it's $618 per credit hour rate. So um, a term generally students on average will take six credits, which is two courses a term. Um, so that is $3,708 in 
tuition plus you'll have like a, a tech fee which is two hundred fifty nine hundred and fifty eight dollars and you actually have the availability to borrow the unsubsidized Stafford loan which is enough it's more than enough to cover your tuition and fees for a term plus provide you with a little bit of residual or living expenses okay anytime you see clinical that's me that's when I get excited. So um, just a little bit about what you can expect as far as your clinical experiences. For an MSN just coming in, uh, you will be required to complete at least 675 clinical hours, and it would be a minimum of 16 weeks of clinical. Um, and we're talking about after you complete your didactics, once you start your clinical, the clinical part of your program. Um, it's important to note, though, that we don't just count hours. We also count um, visit types and competencies. So is we don't want you just banking a bunch of hours. We want you to be having very uh, specific clinical experiences. If you're a PGC, we give you credit for that first clinical program and your total clinical hours are 540 hours. And you can probably compete that within 14 weeks um, or you can uh, have a minimum of 14 weeks. Um, we don't want you going so fast that you're not able to process what you're learning, but neither do we want you here until our great grandchildren graduate from high school either. So there's a method to our madness to keep you moving at a good rate. Um, there's also the companion DMP, and that is an additional 360 clinical hours. They're a little bit different clinical hours than your um, than your MSN, your PGC hours, but it's an additional 360 clinical hours beyond that. Um, and I did speak a little bit about your FMP clinical re requirements um, because we want FMP is the broadest of the uh, programs that we have here at FNU, and we take care of uh, patients from birth to geriatrics and everything in between, male and female. And um, so we have to have a broad span and have some very specific things that we want to make sure that you're exposed to while you're in your um, clinical practicum. Dr. Arterberry, can I add something on this Please. slide? I'd like to point out to those attending that for an MSN student who completes the DMP, they will earn a thousand clinical hours. And that is a very strong, well-prepared clinician. Um, you would be well-prepared to work in just about any area that you desire. So I believe that's a real strength of our program. Thank you, Dr. Chapel. that is a strength. And here's just a few of the people that make up our team. Of course, myself, Dr. Arterberry, you've met. We also have course coordinators who are lead faculty in the courses, and they work with a team of course faculty who um, the number of course faculty depends on the number of the students, but these are the faculty that work, work, will work with you with each course. And we do teach every course every term. So there's no having to wait a year to get into a course, every course, every term. Dr. Arterberry has talked about the regional clinical faculty, a key faculty for our student success. They work with you very closely during your clinical hours. We have an academic advisor system. This is someone who will work with you from the very beginning of your time at Frontier all the way through the program. And we have clinical advisors and we have the entire clinical outreach department that we'll speak about in a minute. The financial aid officer, um, Rainey represents this department and she has financial aid officers that work with her in that department. And then credentialing coordinator. Um, this is a person that comes to you from the office of uh, credentialing. And these are just some pictures of different faculty and staff at Frontier. And Dr. Artiberry and I would like to talk together for just a minute about what it is like to be a family nurse practitioner. Dr. Artiberry gave you a description of some of the things that you would be prepared to do. You would be prepared to care for patients from birth to geriatrics. 
both genders and in multiple settings. We do uh, prepare students to work in the primary care setting, which as you know, is in your community, but you will care for patients in uh, promoting health and caring for acute or episodic illnesses, and then helping with chronic management of chronic problems in all age groups. What would you add to that, Dr. Artaberry? I would just add that as an FMP, um, we consider you a critical part of the access to care issue that is going ongoing right now. Um, and so you improve the access of care in your in your community. So you have a direct impact on the health of your community. And although we do ambulatory care and we work in family practice areas, you will also see family nurse practitioners working in cardiology clinics, pulmonology clinics, dermatology clinics, and, and several specialties. So even though we start off a, as a very broad program, which we're gonna prepare you in a broad fashion, um, we also have a, a place for you if, if you have a specific interest in a specific specialty that will allow you to do clinical hours in that specialty to help you prepare for that as well. It's a very rewarding uh, type of practice because oftentimes, at least I find myself, and I think Dr. Chapp, I speak for you as well, we have taken care of children, parents, and grandparents. So you really can get to know your, uh, your patient or your, your, your client population very well. And uh, I think that's what I'd add. Thanks, Dr. Artaberry. And you know, I think one of the beautiful things about being a family nurse practitioner is the variety where you can look, you can work in a setting where you see all ages or you could be more focused. And that's what you would be prepared to do because we have a focus on geriatrics, women's health, pediatric and men's health. So you'll be well prepared for any population. And I wanted to speak about resiliency. You know, as nurses, we are resilient. Many of us are resilient, but graduate school helps you grow your resiliency because it is a time of balance, trying to balance your, your graduate work, your work as a nurse, and then your family life. Resiliency is defined as adapting well in the face of adversity, trauma, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress. And we do this as nurses. We do this uh, very well, but resiliency is a key trait to success in, uh, at Frontier. This picture shows some photos of our new campus in Versailles. It has just been completed and COVID, COVID has slowed us opening the camp campus, but our plans are to be back on campus this fall. And you can see the buildings are beautiful. There's uh, housing for students, 98 students in the dorm. Uh, there's a wonderful uh, educational building and a clinical building, two different buildings. There is uh, a cafeteria, a dining hall, and a beautiful uh, campus with lots of gorgeous old trees. So um, it's a very, very beautiful campus. And it is only six miles, I said six miles, from the Blue Cross Airport. So that's kind of a big deal for faculty and students who are coming in and out of the campus. Let's stop right here and see um, if any of those of you attending have any questions about the life of a nurse practitioner, a family nurse practitioner. You are welcome to turn your microphones on or either tap it, type in the chat box. We'd we'll be happy to hear your questions. Hi there. Uh, my name's Amy, and I wanted to ask you: Is uh, is there are there any states that uh, don't recognize your program? For example, like state of Washington, is it recognized in state of Washington? How do I go about that? What? Go ahead, Rainy. I was going to say, Amy, there is on our web website. Now, the only state right now that uh, we, we're not currently accepting applicants from is New York. But on our website, there is a, and I will post the link. I'm going to post the link um, here in the chat where you can actually go on there and you can look up a, look up your actual state 
your state, your specific state, and see. But Washington right now, if and correct me if I'm wrong, you all, it, we are, we're accepting applicants from Washington. There's no issues. All right, I agree, Rainey. And one thing to know, Amy, is we are acutely aware of the state's requirements to have students, and we work very hard to meet those requirements and make ourselves available to students in those states. So we're very conscious of that. And um, I agree with Rainey. I think New York is the only one right now. Okay, thank you. Thank God I'm not from New York. So. Uh, <laughs> And then another question was, I am so sorry, and these questions may be like, I might, might be asking a stupid question, but I just, I just missed a little bit of, um, of your session, like first 10 minutes or so. I was just wondering, I have MSN in nursing education, and I wanted to do SMP. Uh, I knew you said something about it. I just logged in at that time. Um, okay. For um, the person who already has an MSc in nursing education, you would not be eligible for um, a PGC admission, but you would be eligible for the regular MSN um, admission. What you could possibly do is look at transferring any courses that very closely meet the requirements of our courses. I, I just asked, um, usually how many, credits is that, uh, the regular program? How many oh, I think she, yeah, I think she's mean how many credits are in the MSM program. Okay, okay. Can you, um, uh, for the MSN FMP program, it's 61 credits to complete. Mm -hmm. And that's if you go, Sorry? it's 61 credits. And that's if you go full-time or part-time. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Also put that in the chat in case we were cutting out for you too, Amy. Yes. Um, Dr. Arterberry, there's a question in the chat box concerning clinicals. Would you like to answer that? Absolutely, Heather. That's a great question. Do most FMP students do their clinical experience at a single site or multiple sites. Most of our FMP students need about three to four sites to complete all of the site visits and the competencies that they need. Because you most likely, unless you have that perfect site that sees everything, um, which is very unusual, you'll probably need a pediatric site, a women's health site, and a family and a family or an internal medicine site to make sure you're getting up those adults in geriatrics. So most of our students um, utilize that number of sites. And also, again, they have the option to do a specialty rotation where they can go into a, a, a specialty clinic and do it as well. So three to four sites, I would say, is the normal for most FMP students. Um, how far do most need to travel and how flexible is the schedule for those who are continue to work part time. This program is perfect for people who are continuing to work part time because you build your clinical experience, the way it works for you, we do have some. Um, let's see some you must do at least 20 hours a week initially in the first early courses. And in 716, when you're about to finish, you have to do 30 hours a week. So you have to kind of plan that into your lifestyle. But if you need to do 20 hours a week, that is fine. But if you get to a place where you can do more hours a week, then you can do that. It is built around what your schedule is. Um, I would love to say that everybody has a site in their backyard and they just have to go out of their back gate to get to clinical, but that's not always the case. Sometimes there is some travel involved, um, especially during this COVID time um, as students are finding those sites. And I actually have students who have family in another state that makes it easier for them to go there to get their women's health. So they go there, do their women's health hours. And so it's different for everybody. I think Jamie could uh, agree with me on that, that every student is a little bit different and we work with you to make it fit what your needs are. Thank you. 
Dr. Artaberry, I was just going to add um, a common question we get is, um, you know, can I do clinicals outside of my home state? And I would just add that you can do clinicals wherever you have a valid RN license. So if you have a compact going to another compact state, that's also fine. And the exceptions to that rule would be um, U.S. military sites and Indian Health Service sites, which allow any state's licensure. Um, so you're not tied to your home state by any means. Thank you, Jamie. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Well, audience, do we have any other admission questions that we could help with? There is another question in the chat and it says, does the program staff help with finding clinical preceptors if you have an issue finding one? And that's from Jennifer. Oh, and Jamie just asked it, which is yes, our unit loves to meet one-on-one -on -one with you. And they do a great job meeting one on one with you, Jamie is being quite um, modest here. But when I say that you have support and you have a team behind you, that is one face in the team, most definitely. Uh, Jamie Wheeler is here representing the Department of Clinical Out Outreach. Jamie, would you like to talk more about what your department does? Sure. So our unit will be one of the units you meet at Frontier Bound Orientation. So we do a session um, about how to kind of orient yourself to this process of thinking about sites and preceptors, how to navigate, how to outreach. We've had to be um, very creative this past year with COVID. So we've had students, um, you know, doing some new things like um, making websites to share with potential preceptors, making like a one minute intro video. Um, so we've had some really creative things. So we talk about using LinkedIn um, and we do a webinar a several times each term too. We call it our clinical, um, clinical Search 101 webinar, but we put that on about three times a term, and um, it's like a really friendly, relaxed environment where we talk to you about tips and kind of wrapping your head around this process. And then we're always here to meet with you individually, too. Um, but we will be here to, um, you know, hold your hand and guide you through the program. I always let students know I don't have a clinical background myself, but that's where your RCF comes in. So it is a, a good team effort here. So I kind of get you oriented and talk about search tips. And then your RCF is the one that's going to be approving your overall clinical plan. So don't feel like you're going to be alone out there. You know, you do have eyes on your plan. You do have someone who's going to be looking things over and making sure you're getting everything that you need to get um, for those hours and visit types. Thank you very much, Jamie. That was really yes. helpful. Um, there is a question in the chat box. Brandy, can you ask that answer that how many qualified applicants do you get each term for the FMP program? How many qualified applicants do we receive? Oh, here it is. How many qualified applicants do we receive each term? Current, you know, it, it varies from term to term. Winter, you know, because because we enroll and students apply for four terms a year, winter, which is January, and then April, and July, and October. Currently, we are going to, we're accepting 68 students a term, and right now we have uh right at 100 applicants. And a lot of times, you know, even if you make it, even if you're, you're on the wait list, sometimes students' life happens and they have to, they, they decline their offer or it's not the right time. So we pull students off the wait list. So you all don't let that discourage you at all. So please apply. And so, you know, like I said, right now, I think we have a little over 100 and we will be accepting 68 and we allow students, you know, students will carry over on the wait list, you know, for up to two terms. And Rainy, you make a really good point about the wait list because we have many students who come into the program who are pulled off the wait list. Yes, that yes, Many. there is. So if, if you apply and you get on the wait list, don't think that is a bad thing at all, um, at all. We exhausted our wait list this last term. So let that, you know, that, that goes to show you. Mm -hmm. So please apply. 
Um, and I wanted to share this picture and say, and this is one of our graduates, one of our recent graduates. And the saying is success doesn't come to you, you go to it. And you can see how thrilled this young lady is about her graduation. And that's a wonderful day, wonderful day. And it's the day that we're committed to getting you to. Um, so we don't have you come in, whether it's off the wait list or whatever, when once you get in here, we're committed to working with you um, to meet your goal. Um, this slide here, so what is the next step? What else do you need to do? Um, we're just waiting for you. So you, the ball is in your court. You make the next move. Um, go to www.frontier.edu. Get all the information you need. You want to be a family nurse practitioner or you wouldn't be sitting through this tonight. Um, FNU is the place to go to get your FNP. Um, so just get ready and make that move. Get in contact with us and get your application started. Thank you, Dr. Artaberry. Rainey, would you like to speak to this slide? Sure. Um, like I said before, the, the deadline where you all were only eight days away, but you can do it in eight days. If you have any just general questions, even if you're not really for sure exactly who it goes to, you can send them to admissions, uh, but we have other offices on here too. Just admissions at frontier.eu and it goes to the entire admissions office. Um, our counselors, the financial aid officers, they assist inquiries and applicants by last name. So you know, depending if you send an email to admissions, depending on which admissions officer replies to you will be the one that will work with you throughout the your application process. Um, and there is a link there for the required MSN application application and materials, which we touched on a little earlier, the application materials are, you know, like I said, the you know, of course, the application, your resume, two essays, references, transcripts, and I think maybe that's it. And of course, the GP, the criteria includes, you know, GPA, R, being an RN with a year's like um, years worth of experience, an unencumbered license, and then we reviewed the PGC application materials, which are the same thing, uh, with the exception of you have to, you know, provide your APRN license. And here's an email for in a the clinical outreach there's a link to their office on our website and their email address and financial aid there's a link to the financial aid page and if you have questions you can send it to the financial aid office at that address too and if you send it there if you have va questions financial aid you send it there and we will field those questions for you hi i'm Jeannie. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um, I was just wondering, I'm applying for fall um, and I'm very excited. Um, and I just wanted to ask, I'm a, I am a mother of two young children um, and working as well. Um, and I'm applying for um, part-time programs. So I just wanted to know how many other students you have that are also mothers and working as a nurse. And um, so I just wanted to know, you know, we hardly ever have a student who does not have to work. Okay. Rare is a student who does not have to work. And many, many people come through the program with small children, teenagers, caring for family members. So it, this is a very common occurrence in our student population to have to work and have to care for family members, including children. I do think you're very wise to go with the part-time option. Um, it will probably be your best plan for success, but know that you join many, many other students who are in the exact same circumstances as you are. That's great to hear. Thank you so much. I'll also add too, if you decide you want to start at a full-time rate and it's too much to handle, you can talk to the advisor that you're mm -hmm. assigned to and just say, hey, I'm struggling. I need, I need some help put me to a part-time and they adjust your program a set study, so to speak, so that it doesn't hurt your graduation. It just pushes it back a little bit more. If you start full-time and it's just too much, just talk to us and we can adjust it for you. Katie, and that is really Katie, good advice. You, yeah. Can you also go, 
Can you, you can also go, go in the way other way direction? Yes, ma'am. You can go the other way too. If you yeah. start part time, you're like, man, this, I got this, you know, <laughs> and you want to go, then you can switch to okay. full time. Now, it doesn't really change the amount of clinical, I don't think. I mean, that's still 675, still whenever you finish it, you still have to be enrolled those six to nine months. But if you, if you want to go full time, you can do that too. And there's no like probation or nothing for doing anything like that. There's no fee. You just have to tell somebody they adjust your program of study. So it's real, it's real useful that way. Oh, that's, I would just that's like great. to put a pin in there too, because what you're going to be learning, you're going to be using. So I hate for you to go in and just try to rush, 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 rush and get it when it's better if you take enough time to absorb and learn. Graduate school is a little bit different because you are really getting information that you're going to use when you get out and get in clinical. I want you to know it, to remember it, to have time to process it. So, um, you know, it's everybody has their own different ways of doing things, but I just encourage you to enjoy the process, the education, the, the ability to slow down and learn and um, get the most that you can out of it. I have one kind of follow on question with the timing and the part time and full time. If a student needs to like life happens and you need to pause in your program. Can you address how that's handled if somebody would need to like take one term off and then come back in or is that even possible? It, it is possible. Frontier offers something called the academic hiatus that is a plan term away from your program of study and you there's a time period that you have to apply, but it just means that your your courses stop where you leave and then start back when you come back. So it's a plan term away from school. We also have something called an emergency academic hiatus when you have an emergency that renders it impossible for you to continue as a student. That's a little bit more of an application process and a conversation with me, but we do offer that so that your grades aren't harmed and your place is still there at Frontier. Thank you. And I want to I want to build on something Dr. Artiberry said just a minute ago. You know, as you come through the program, your your job is to build that body of knowledge that you can take and move, go into the clinical setting with, go into clinical practice with, and deliver advanced practice care. And building that body of knowledge takes time. It takes severe study. I'll say severe. And it takes a lot of work and it, you know, it is much better to go at a pace where you can do that than have superficial learning by going quickly through the courses and get out and not be adequately prepared. So mm -hmm. two courses a term is a good idea. That's great. And I've posted the link to the programs of study in here. I've posted in there a couple of times, but it's the most recent uh, thing that was posted. And, and I want to say, um, Dr. Chapel, I don't know if you mentioned before, but this is being recorded and it will be shared with everyone. So you can refer back to it. And I think even the chats are saved. Thank you, Randy. Thank you. What other questions can we help you with? Um, I just wanted to ask another question. During the program, are the lectures, um, are they live or recorded or both is, um, okay. since they're online? We, we have a true dedication to delivering an asynchronous program, meaning that you will not have faculty that say to you, I'm going to lecture every Wednesday at nine o'clock. You have to come to class. We don't function that way. Any uh, presentation, anything that the faculty deliver is recorded so that students who are not able to attend have access to that recording. So we're not going to say to you, you have to come to class at this time every week. The thing that you may see in the course is if you have to do a presentation or some type of group work, you may have um, a sign up schedule where there's multiple choices and you sign up at a time that you can be there and that is you have to be there, but it is your choice of times and you know I think the faculty function with great respect, knowing that all of our students are having to work so they know that and present the courses, knowing that. 
Thank you. And I just want to put another plug in. It, you have, you know, choices of where you want to go to get your education. The thing that I think that sets Frontier apart is, is that you don't get a watered down program. I want you guys to hear that. <laughs> it is rigorous. It, you will learn what you need to learn. Um, but the support that you have, I think is very uh, exceptional when you look at, at other programs. So the rigor is there. Um, don't think you're getting anything other than the best. As, it, as you can see by our board passing results, we do not play about a, <laughs> educating our students, okay? Um, but um, I want you to hear that, that, you know, it's not gonna be a, and I don't think graduate school ever should be just, you know, an easy walk in the park, but it'll be a good walk, okay? You're right, Dr. Arterberry. Our university is not a university that weeds out students. We don't have that philosophy. Our philosophy is if you're admitted, then you have our commitment to your success. Now you have to do the work, but you have our commitment to work with you for your success. I'm gonna address the question in the chat and Dr. Chapel, correct me if I'm incorrect. If the PA requirement, if the class is needed, how and when will it be fitted into the program? And it's either in your first or second term. I believe the, it's preferred to be in the first. Okay, yes. it's the first term. It is, you're right, it is the first rating. And we have that course in our, uh, offered at our university. This may be jumping the gun a little bit as a potential, as an applicant, um, but I was just curious, is Frontier Bound planned to be in person for this upcoming term the fall or will it be online? Well, we are tentatively planning it for the fall. Now that there is a big, we could change it statement in that, but we're hoping to have it on campus, on the live campus in the fall. But don't be surprised if it gets changed. You depend on CDC recommendations and recommendations from the state of Kentucky. Well, not hearing any, and we're getting to the close of our hour. Thank you so much for coming. I hope you have found this helpful. And thank you to the faculty and staff that were here. You really helped make a great presentation. So thanks to each one of you. But audience, if you have further questions, you know, we would love to hear from you. And, but we would really love to see you um, enrolled at Frontier. Look for your all's applications. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.